Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Today we're discussing a battle from a war that most Americans have forgotten about. I'm of course speaking about the War of 1812, the war where the young United States found itself at war once again with its former colonial master, Great Britain. In American schools, kids don't spend much time learning about this war, probably because we did so poorly and ended only with return to the status quo. We hear that the British were attacking our merchant ships and impressing our sailors into their navy, and how was the main cause of the conflict. We'll also learn about the British sacking Washington DC only to be stopped at Fort McHenry, and how it provided the inspiration for Francis Scott Key to compose our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. We may even learn that the term Uncle Sam, which has become synonymous with the U.S. government, got its origins in the War of 1812, from a military supplier by the name of Sam Wilson, who provided meat rations to American soldiers. Americans, however, tend to gloss over the fact that we invaded Canada, thinking it would be captured easily, and burn the town of York, which is now the city of Toronto, causing the British to retaliate by burning down the White House and the Capitol building when they captured Washington. The evasion also helped foster Canadian nationalism, but Americans tried to pretend keeping us out wasn't one of the reasons an entire nation was founded. Americans also tend to forget defeating the Native American tribes of the Midwest that were allied with the British, which was a big priority at the time. Despite failing to beat Britain, we did manage to drive them off their homes, but frankly history books omit that since it doesn't really make us look all that heroic, and we rather pretend the Midwest was just empty wilderness. But one thing Americans will definitely learn about is the Battle of New Orleans. The Battle of New Orleans was fought on January 8, 1815. It was the largest and last major battle fought during the war, and it was a complete American victory. Americans suffered only 70 casualties, while the British suffered around 2,000. Here is the story behind the battle. British forces, commanded by General Edward Pakenham, arrived on December 14, 1814, on the shores of Louisiana, and began their march on New Orleans, with the goal of cutting off American trade from the Mississippi River. At one point, a British force of 1,800 camped just nine miles from New Orleans on December 23rd and could have attacked the city, as the road was unguarded, but the commander instead decided to wait for reinforcements. By not advancing, the Americans under the command of future President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, had time to gather their forces and beef up the defenses around New Orleans. As author and historian William Weber suggested in his short story, Britain's Pyrrhic Victory, New Orleans, 1814, if the British kept marching, the larger British force, made of mostly veteran soldiers, would have faced a smaller American force, which was mostly made up of militia and other irregulars, without the benefit of any defenses to hide behind. But they didn't keep moving, and thus when the British finally attacked New Orleans on January 8, 1815, the British were forced to attack entrenched positions while under heavy American fire, suffering massive casualties. Unable to break the American lines, the British retreated, ended any hope of capturing New Orleans. And yet despite the British defeat, their loss had zero impact on the end of the war. The battle happened after the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war between the U.S. and Britain, was signed. Granted, it had not yet been ratified by the U.S. government, but for all intents and purposes, the war was over. Unfortunately, due to how difficult it was to communicate over vast distances in 1815, no one told the armies fighting at New Orleans in time. Nevertheless, although it did nothing to change the outcome of the war, the American victory in New Orleans was a huge morale boost for a country who didn't have much to celebrate after how poorly they did in the War of 1812. It helped propel Jackson to national fame, and the victory was used by the Democratic Republicans, the political party in power at the time, to ridicule their rivals, the Federalists, who fade into obscurity shortly thereafter. But what if the British had won? Would history change all that drastically? Let's assume the British could have captured New Orleans if they attacked earlier. The short-term changes to history would mean that the British would continue to march north along the Mississippi River, capturing other forts and towns until news of the treaty again reached them in February, as it did in our timeline. If Jackson survived the defeat, he would have led the remnants of his army in trying to hold back the British advance. How successful he would be would depend on the losses he sustained and what reinforcements he received. It's possible that had the British managed to capture large parts of Louisiana, they may have ignored the Treaty of Ghent and instead tried to obtain more concessions from the Americans, but I've also seen other sources squash that argument by saying the British had no intention of not honoring the treaty, so in all likelihood they would have evacuated Louisiana. Besides, Napoleon would be escaping his imprisonment from Elba in February, so the British had more important things to worry about. Without a victory at New Orleans, America would not have that morale boost it so desperately needed at the end of the war. Instead, this alternate War of 1812 would be seen as a real defeat, with America having very little to show for the money spent and lives lost. This could have helped the Federalists, who had been in decline for years. They had been opposed to the War of 1812 because of how much it hurt the economy of New England, where their support was strongest. The region was dependent on trade, but the Royal Navy's blockade put an end to that. In response to that blockade, Federalist delegates met in Hartford in 1814 to discuss their grievances. 
Although secession from the United States was brought up, that was considered an extreme measure, and instead the Federalists drafted a report that accused the federal government of unconstitutionally infringing upon the sovereignty of the states, and suggested new amendments to the Constitution, which included prohibiting any trade embargo lasting over 60 days, requiring a two-thirds congressional majority for declaration of offensive war, admission of a new state, or interdiction of foreign commerce, removing the three-fifths representation advantage of the South, limiting future presence to one term, and requiring each president to be from a different state than his predecessor. In our timeline, the Federalists arrived in Washington around the same time news of the victory at New Orleans did. Thus, the Democratic Republicans were able to paint the Federalists as defeatists and traitors, ending any hope of their becoming a force in American politics ever again. If Jackson was defeated at New Orleans, however, the Federalist grievances may have had more sympathetic audience since the American people had very little to celebrate for what had arguably been a potentless war. Whether all the amendments I mentioned would have been adopted is unlikely, but at least the Federalists would be given new life and could in turn paint the Democratic Republicans as incompetent warmongers. This could allow a Federalist to be elected president in 1816 by riding the wave of dissatisfaction from the outcome of the war, which would allow them to implement some of the ideas they came up with in Hartford. Although Rufus King ran for president in 1816 as a Federalist in our timeline, I get the sense he only ran because no other Federalist wanted to. But in this alternate timeline, a more well-known and influential Federalist may try to take the White House, like Timothy Pickering, the former Secretary of State who helped organize the Hartford Convention. Then again, Pickering tended to be pro-secessionist, so it's possible a more moderate Federalist, like Hartford Convention Chairman and Senator George Cabot of Massachusetts, would run instead. Meanwhile, without the victory at New Orleans, Andrew Jackson would never rise to national prominence and thus would never be elected President of the United States in 1828. What would this mean for American history without Andrew Jackson at the helm? Well, for one thing, it was Jackson's supporters who ultimately formed the Democrats, and while this party was vastly different from its modern incarnation, without him to rally the troops, it's possible a different political party, one designed to oppose the revitalized Federalists, would arise instead. It may fill the same niche as the Democrats, but it would take inspiration from a completely different individual, whoever that may be. Additionally, while Jackson wouldn't be there to sign the Indian Removal Act, which removed Native American tribes in the southern states to lands across Mississippi, American settlers were already pushing westward, and even without Jackson, they would continue to do so. In our alternate timeline, it's possible there may be more Native Americans living in the southeast, which would make for an interesting exploration into southern demographics, but then again, maybe not. It all depends if there is someone in the White House with enough of a backbone and interest in protecting Native American rights which is sadly exceedingly rare in American history, even in the present. And what about the Second Bank of the United States, the institution that helped govern the American economy from 1816 to 1836? Modeled after Federalist Alexander Hamilton's National Bank, for a time it was the largest moneyed institution in the world, but it was opposed by other banks because it prevented them from lending money on potentially risky deals. President Andrew Jackson also saw it as a corrupt institution, and thus fought against its charter renewal in 1836. In this alternate timeline where Jackson never ascends to the presidency, and the Federalists continue to influence the United States, the bank may live on, which could have a major impact on American economic history. Furthermore, our revitalized Federalists may push through more protective tariffs that would anger the South. I talked about this briefly in my other video on Andrew Jackson, but when Jackson became president, he had to deal with South Carolina threatening to secede in 1828 over high tariffs that they objected to. The crisis ended after the tariff was amended and Jackson threatened to invade South Carolina. But in our alternate timeline, would whoever was in the White House be able to successfully manage a tariff crisis? If it's a Federalist, they may not be willing to amend the tariff, and, coupled with other policies that the Federalists supported that were unpopular in the South, more Southern states may secede, leading to an earlier civil war. Granted, that is an extreme scenario, but it could happen. And what about American culture? How would it be affected by a loss at New Orleans? Well, all of the songs, plays, films, and more inspired directly by the battle would never be made, like the song The Battle of New Orleans, famously sung by Johnny Horton. Meanwhile, American symbols like the Star Spangled Banner and the term Uncle Sam may never have been adopted. Both came out of the war, but in this alternate timeline, the stigma caused by America's complete and utter failure in the War of 1812 would mean Americans would probably not adopt these symbols because of its association with a failed war. Speaking of symbols, America would need to find someone else to put on the $20 bill if Andrew Jackson ever became president. Unfortunately, it's hard to guess what other cultural changes would come about with the point of divergence being so far in the past, but I would love to hear any suggestions from my fellow alternate historians. So that's my scenario for an American defeat at the Battle of New Orleans. And to be honest, this was a fun scenario to imagine. I like how one small event, like a change in the outcome of a battle that had absolutely no impact on a war because it was already over, can still call massive changes to a timeline. So next time someone tells you some event from history is not important, 
Tell them about the Battle of New Orleans and how a battle fought after a war ended could have upended history as we know it. Well, that is up to say in a subject. If you like what I do, please comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mutrich, the Alternate Historian. Bye.